Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony. Friendship is inf Friendship is information? <laughs> I'm keeping that one in. And this is our thoughts on My Little Pony. Friendship is Magic. Season 7, Episode 20. A Health of Information. Okay, this episode was kind of dark if you really think about it. Being, being turned into a tree. Spoilers for Fallout Equestria? What do they do? Read Fallout Equestria! I mean, yeesh! A disease that turns you into a tree! Oh my god, that's... that. Or did they read... Spoilers for a Flinks book? Jesus! Flinks in, like, the world something. It's uh, He lands on a planet where all the plants want to kill you. It's just not right. <laughs> so, yeah, this episode was kind of surprisingly dark underneath the surface. And considering, well, they couldn't have her die of something, so they had to make it serious, but she couldn't die. So she gets turned into a tree that propagates the cycle. This puts a really dark spin on Fluttershy's... I would like to be a tree. Really dark spin on that. Okay, Fluttershy, you can be a tree. Yes. Oof. Also, if they wanted to find this person, why didn't they go and talk to Celestia? She's been around for a thousand years, and if she heard of a great healer, I'm pretty sure she went and met her. Probably. But I think, like, it's the main thing about you, no reasonable answer was allowed. Everything was a setup to get to the end goal. Yeah. Also, another weird thing about this episode is the fact that it was labeled 18 on the official app. So they went back some numbers. So what are they doing? Releasing these out of order? I don't know. It's very strange. Did Maybe when they got everything set up for the app, they were given a different order, so they put the tags up wrong? Because they've been broadcasting them in the same order as the televised broadcast. Mm-hmm. And they seem to be available on iTunes and Amazon in this order. Not the number order, but this order. So, odds. So, let's start with the first reasonable thing. Okay, you need Zakora's help to find the crisscross moss. Fluttershy, you're the Pegasus. Why were you not flying right above the water collecting the moss? Why was Zakora on the verge hanging on by her tail to get hoofsfuls of this stuff for you? Yeah, that's a very valid point. Like, why didn't I think of that kind of point? Yeah, and even if Sakura was also helping, it should have been both of them. Fluttershy shouldn't have just been standing there watching. But if Fluttershy had been by Sakura, she could have probably caught Sakura and kept her from falling in so badly, and then she wouldn't have swum past the lily pad and got infected. Therefore, Fluttershy was not allowed to fly. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on in these last couple episodes of like, we're going to take these reasonable things that would actually happen and would work better for the actual universe and just throw them out of the window because we want this plot to happen. And the way this is set up, I think it's set up for something that I've vaguely been hearing about, but I'm not going to say it because Ember hasn't got this information either, so I want to move that over. I'm pretty sure if you look up the next toy line, for those people who are actually interested, you'll find out what I'm talking about. So yeah, it seems to be hinting at something in the future because of how many times they brought up this person and the fact that she disappeared. I'm thinking something's being hinted at for the season finale. Well, yeah, because they state very clearly that she disappeared. Multiple times this is stated. And I think based on the stories episode, those people may be hinted at for future stuff as well. Even though they didn't mysteriously disappear, all these great people were talked about, and we're getting a lot of that in this season. I'm thinking we may be getting, like, other people who are actually going to save the day, or the main six have to go and find these people to actually save the day. That's kind of where everything seems to be leaning towards. I did like a few things about Mage Meadowbrook, like that she wasn't a unicorn, but she was still a mage, and that she had a healer's mask which was a very common thing in our own human history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I have some pictures to prove it from a recent Renaissance fair I went to. This guy had this awesome costume with one of those plague masks. Yeah. 
Or you could just watch the live action Beauty and the Beast. Because you know that's got to be historically accurate. <laughs> eh, they may have used historical facts in it. So, yeah, I, I liked the flow of the episode, but those points you brought up, I think, were one of the things that was bugging me about it. Because these last two episodes, like, there was something that bugged me about the episode as I watched it, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then you bring them up. I'm like, yes. Yes, that's what was bugging me about the episode. This is one of the reasons I love doing these with you. You always give me a wonderful perspective. Even though it was brought up several times by Twilight that Fluttershy should rest, I wasn't getting the lesson hammered home that the whole thing was take care of yourself so you can take care of others. Because Fluttershy was so focused on fixing the problem that she accidentally caused. Which we just dealt with a couple episodes ago in Daring Done. Because Daring Do didn't mean to wreck any of the stuff that she wrecked or leave without paying or do any of the negative things that harmed the citizens of that village. It was a side effect of the good that she was doing. And our whole lesson there was taking responsibility for your actions. Which is what Fluttershy was trying to do. So we kind of almost have some contradiction to that because we have Zakora going, it was an accident, you're fine. And we have Twilight going, you need to rest. Both of them trying to pull her away from taking responsibility. Because thanks to the way the episode was written, it really is all her fault because I'd like to reiterate, she is a Pegasus. Mm hmm But I think it was less Twilight trying to take her away from the responsibility and more of Twilight trying to help her properly take care of what she did so she can actually do it within full capacity instead of wearing herself out so she actually can't complete the task. Yes, and I have more later on, but let's stay a little bit in order. Very impressive all that reading and cross-referencing and researching to figure out that, was it the mysterious mask or the magical mask? The mis... The masked mage or something like that? It was like mask something. Yeah. At least it wasn't mask mask. Yes. Thank you, American backwood and masked common writer. Hey, you do realize that's redundant, right? What do you mean? They're two different words. Not really. Mm -hmm. You just called him masked masked writer. So, fast forward to traveling to find Mage Meadowbrook's home, which looks exactly like the illustrations and looks exactly like the flashbacks. Interesting that in all the time since Mage Meadowbrook disappeared, neither the tree that was her home or the tree that the flash bees nest in grew at all. Yeah, though I do like the comment of, anyone who lives in a tree is perfectly fine by my book. Yes, yes, Twilight and the Dryads would get along very well. <laughs> and her excitement of, library? Oh, well, libraries come in all sizes. Uh, I also like how much of a bookworm Twilight is comes out a little bit when she goes, oh, I do want to find out what happens. Yeah, it's like, oh, we can probably skip this one too, but I do want to see where it's going. I'm wondering if she read it during some of their downtime, during the three days that they tried to get the honey from the flash bees. Just, and her excuse was, hey, there may actually be something in here. Like, when she was younger, she came up with something. And she only remembered it. No, or just the fact that they're taking a break because you need to take breaks. Yeah, but it also sounds like while Fluttershy was out cold for those three days, they both were continuously trying to figure out some way to get the honey. Yes, and they tried many different things, I'm sure, but they probably took breaks in between. And I don't want to touch on that point yet, so back to Cattail just rocking creepily in that chair. Yeah, and creepily saying, like, I do that a lot. Scare ponies are rock creepily in a chair. I love how he's like, both, I think. <laughs> mm hmm And this is very uh, New Orleans, Louisiana type setup. I was almost waiting for the swamp benders to show up. Which are actually water benders, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me rephrase. The water benders from the swamp. Yeah. I think calling them swamp benders is really good, too. 
And he's not at all bothered that they just walked into his home and started poking around. What is this, a Legend of Zelda game? <laughs> no, they would have broken pots. Uh, and that reminds me of this great fan video. <laughs> not going to talk about it much, but I can't really recommend the... I can't really describe the search, but try live-action Zelda short about breaking pots. See if that helps you find it, because it's a great little short where someone playing Link goes into a thing, breaks a lot of pots in front of a guard. I remember that one. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. But back to MLP. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it was nice that we got the flashbacks from Mage Meadowbrook with um, the reading of the journal entries. And we have a lot of similarities in her approach to the Flash Bees and Fluttershy's approach. She takes the same route and gets stung in many of the same places. Also, I think there was a slight animation reuse when each of them uh, looked into the hive. Hmm, probably. They probably made it longer than they needed to so they could edit it down for both versions. Because one was slightly shorter than the other. Also, I'd like to know if Fluttershy had been at full capacity, would the stare have worked? I have a feeling it probably would have, but because she was basically so out of it, it... Yeah, but we physically saw the effects of the stare. It was like watching the Care Bear stare. Uh... Yeah, it was kind of like that. Yep. And it was the cousin's call, I believe? Or was it Rar? Hmm. Oh well, back to MLP. Yes. And yes, the final resolution was clever of realizing that out of all the disguises and everything they tried, including things Cattail doesn't want to talk about, that there was a disguise that did work. But... In all of these attempts, we get into another one of, we had to throw out everything reasonable to get what we wanted. Because they even said Twilight tried to use magic to calm the beast. Um, for shield? That, or go in with the magic, pull out the honey. You could have also force shield around the beehive, pulled out the honey. Yes, or got the bees to chase you and force shield them. While somebody else gathers the honey? Yep. I mean, she's an alicorn. Even if she can't calm them down, there's other ways to use magic to get the honey out of that hive. Yes. And many of those things could even be accomplished without magic. Just like ticking them off and running like heck because she's an alicorn. She could just wink back to the hive and get away from them. So she gets them to chase her. Once she's far enough away, she winks back to the hive. In the meantime, somebody else is collecting the honey. And she winks back specifically to the hive in order to protect the person in case they don't get away in time for the flash bees returning. So, yeah, that really frustrated me because if I can see all these solutions that fit within the parameters of the universe as we know it so far, then it just really vexes me. It's, yeah. it's kind of like watching an episode of Blue's Clues. It's right there. No, it's right there. It's, it's there. Right there, you stupid blue dog. Uh, yeah, it's like those children's shows. Can you see this? Stare. You don't need to wait that long. All the kids have already pointed to it. They've pointed to it multiple times. You can go now. But yeah, when you write something like this, you need to, if you go to run into those problems, you need to come up with good solutions out of the problems, not just ignore that they're there which is basically what they did in this episode. The solutions to that problem, you can't just ignore them. You have to come up with a good reason not to have them. The quick explanation kind of worked for not using magic, but yeah. Oh, but all they said was she couldn't even use magic to calm them. But there's plenty of other things that can be done with magic. We established back in season one that Twilight had mastered over 200 different kinds of magic. And that was in season one, pre Halicorn. Mm-hmm. Though we should probably move on from this topic. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would also like to know how they got word in the bayou about Zakora's progress. Yeah. I could understand if Spike came along, but... Unless Spike specifically sent them a letter? If he's capable of sending to anyone other than Celestia? Mm, maybe. 
also let's backtrack to almost the beginning. I do not want that doctor for my doctor. Okay, you don't run the tests in the room in front of the patient. And you don't give bad news and then go, I'll leave you two to take this in. Jerk. Absolute jerk on so many levels. Yeah, but I think it was supposed to be comedic jerk, but yeah. Don't care. Mm -hmm. Let him be a tree. At first, it wasn't implied that this was highly contagious. That didn't come along really until we were looking at Mage Meadowbrook's journal because the whole bayou got it. Because if Zakora was heavily contagious, she should have been in quarantine and they should have been taking precautions. But obviously they weren't because the doctor got infected and Fluttershy got infected. And considering that up until the point of Mage Meadowbrook's journal, we thought that the only way ponies got infected was directly from the flower itself, it didn't really make sense. Because like Also if this if this tree propagates the way it is, why aren't there more of these trees? Because that's a pretty good way to propagate. Yes. It's like those mold spores that take over ants. Mm-hmm. That must be a nice natural uh, predator, as it were, for that tree to have it so contained, as it were. But shall we go back to where we were? <laughs> yeah, either that or we could go really dark and ponies choose not to allow themselves to become trees. Oof. I'm pretty sure even if they did that, they would still become a tree. Oh, well, then the other thing would be, did the people in the affected areas then destroy the trees? Which is also painful, especially if you used to know the pony. But let's move on from that little bit of darkness. <laughs> I was trying not to go there, but... It's a very dark concept overall. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in some ways it's worse than the petrification ones because at least when people are getting petrified, they're not turning other people to stone. In this one, you become a victim and then you become a perpetrator. So you are a victim of the tree, then you become a tree and create other victims. That's a nasty cycle. Mm-hmm. So... What do you want to talk about next, now that we've gone down that dark rabbit hole? I mean, you keep bringing up a point, but I don't know if we've gotten to that point yet. No, the whole magic thing was what I was waiting to get to when ah. we did that. I just didn't want to say it right then because I had more that I wanted to go over earlier. And the whole lesson of making sure to take care of yourself and not neglecting yourself is a good lesson. But in the way this episode played out overall, to me it felt like Ruby did it better with the interaction between Blake and Yang, where Blake was wearing herself to a thread and Yang intervened and pointed out how she was hurting herself and hurting her goal. And we did it without getting anyone to contract a deadly fever. So, should we wrap up our ideas or are there more details you want to go over? Well, if I keep nitpicking on this, there's not going to be an episode left. <laughs> it had its good points, but... Like I heard you it. laugh a couple of times. Yeah, but like in the it's the main thing about you, the fact that I saw solutions that weren't even considered and things that would have prevented it from happening in the first place just really leaves me frustrated. Like I said, I picked up on these things subconsciously and it didn't I couldn't figure out what was going on until you pointed them out. I was like, oh yeah, that's exactly the problem. Ah, so, overall thoughts? Really nice for world building. Very dark for the fever overall. Oh, that was the other minor nitpick. Zakora's mane. So when she fell in the water, it went flat. So how flat does her mane go when it gets wet? Is the up actually a stylized version? Does that take some gel and some hairspray? Or is it more natural? Because when we have her in the doctor's office, it's back to being her normal mohawk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say for the sake of consistency in this show, I'm going to say her hair is naturally that way. Just when it gets wet, it loses it. And then as it dries out, it puffs up. Just 
something to consider because that's only the second time we've seen her with her mane down. The other time was Nightmare Night. Mm -hmm. That might be a style thing where she puts gel in it and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so actually finishing my thoughts. Some nice world building here. Again, we have some travel. We have history. We have a good lesson, though we got to it in a rather awkward way. And never having been to the New Orleans, Louisiana area, I hope the portrayal of the bayou was reasonable. Uh, as for me, I like the episode, but as I said about the other episode, just something about it overall bugged me, and I couldn't figure out what until Amber brought it up. And I like certain comedy aspects of it. I like the art in the episode, how once Fluttish Hike got the disease not only did her coat get the spots but she also started to kind of lose her color a little bit they desaturated her some to show also how tired she was and i like the way twilight and spike were interacting in the episode with the bake-off and stuff like that god we didn't even touch on the bake-off because it was such a small portion but it was such a cool thing mm -hmm. who knew twilight could cook she looked a little messy. I think it's still a um, bit of a novelty for her. Mm -hmm. I also like how Spike was like, oh, those were actually pretty good. I ate the rest of them. <laughs> uh, so I enjoyed the episode. There were things that bugged me about it. As you said, the handling of the message was awkward, but it was a pretty good summary at the end, and the concepts and world building were good. So I enjoyed it. And this has been our thoughts on... My Little Pony, French Biz Magic, Season 7, Episode 20, A Health of Information. Wow, you're still here? Thanks! Hey, since you're still hanging around, could I ask you to click the like and or the subscribe button? Maybe leave a comment? Uh, since it seems like maybe you have some free time, how about checking out some of our other videos? Or you could also check out more of Lux's art. Um... The other websites have still images, so you can check out all the detail he puts in. You can find it on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, a couple Mastodon servers, and I'm sure more social media as the internet continues to explode. If you really like Lux's art and would maybe like some of your own, he does take commissions. Check the link below for pricing and availability. Um, don't want a customized piece, but would still like to throw a few bits our way? We do have a Patreon and a coffee. Patreon starts at a dollar, and coffee works in increments of three. Thanks again for hanging out.